I just have to say, I love it when the people who put together the readings for the weeks leave sections out. Because what did we miss, right? The readings this morning was from Matthew chapter 11, verses 16 through 19. And then they skipped 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, and went straight to 25. But here's the thing. What is going on here in chapter 11, right? Chapter 10, we, we ended last week and it was Jesus sending the disciples out into the world. And now all of a sudden we've got this weird lesson starting with, but what will I compare this generation to? How do we know what this is even in reference to if we don't know what's happening? Right? So we need to go back a little bit. Chapter 11, Jesus just finished instructing the 12 disciples on what they needed to do and tell them that they needed to go. And then Jesus went out teaching and proclaimed the message in the cities. And then John wound up in prison. Right? John the Baptist is in prison. And he heard that Jesus is out doing all of these things. And he asked one of his disciples to go and to ask Jesus, Are you the one who is to come or are we to wait for another? John the Baptist, the one who is heralding Jesus as the coming Messiah, is questioning whether or not Jesus is the coming Messiah. And John didn't drink and John didn't eat. John was out in the, remember John was out in the wilderness and he wore that funky camel hair suit with the leather belt and he ate, what did he eat? Locusts. He ate bugs and honey, right? So he didn't do anything bad. And then Jesus came along. What did Jesus do? The exact opposite of what John just did. He didn't stay out in the wilderness and and cover himself in camel hair and eat bugs and honey. He sat down with the people that people said he shouldn't be sitting down with. And he drank wine. And if you remember in, in John... He was at the wedding feast and his first sign was to change water into wine, right? Not just, not just any old wine, really good wine, right? So Jesus drank and Jesus ate and Jesus hung out with the people you're not supposed to hang out with. And all of this stuff is happening. And so Jesus sits down and he's teaching his disciples and he's teaching all these other people. And he says, but what am I going to compare this generation to? To children playing in the marketplace where they played a flute and they said nobody danced. And then they started to cry and nobody would cry with them. Right? What does this mean? Something that all of us need to learn at a very young age. What does that mean? Again, it's like Jesus. Not very plain at at the first. But once you open it up, it'll make a lot of sense. If the children are playing music and nobody's dancing... And then they're wailing and nobody's crying with them. If John came and didn't do anything wrong and they're still giving him a hard time because he didn't do the right things. And Jesus came and did everything that he shouldn't have. And they're giving him a hard time because he didn't do the right things. What what, what could anybody do to make anybody happy? Nothing. Right? What's that old adage? You're not going to please everybody. Right? You're not going to make everybody happy. All the time. That's what Jesus is saying here. With the children in the marketplace. And John doing what he did. And Jesus doing what he did. doesn't matter what they would have done. Somebody still would have complained about it. It doesn't matter how they would have brought the message. Somebody still would have complained about it. And Jesus says this. and And then he goes on to say something which we skipped. Right? To the statement of. You only know the Father if I show the Father to you. But come to me. You who are burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Have you ever seen a light burden? Or had an easy yoke? And I'm not talking about an egg yolk, not the yellow part in the egg, right? But we'll get to that in a moment. The section we skipped is entitled in my Bible, Woe to the unrepentant cities. And then Jesus began to reproach the cities in which most of his deeds of power had been done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the deeds of power done in you had been done in Tyre or Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, on that day judgment will come, will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, you will 
be exalt, will you be exalted to heaven? No, you will be brought down to Hades. For if the deeds of power done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have been, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that on that day of judgment, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom than for you. Capernaum is one of the big cities that Jesus had been in. And he's just saying that you're not going to be exalted. You're not going to be lifted up. And it's going to be more tolerable for Sodom. And what is Sodom? Where's Sodom from? Texas. <laughs> There's a Sodom in Texas, yes. <laughs> Genesis. Oh, I thought he said Texas. <laughs> what? Hey? Genesis, right. Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Where the, the angels came and the cities were destroyed. And it's more tolerable for them than it is for Capernaum. And then all of a sudden Jesus says, but come to me. Woe to all of you, but come to me and I will give you rest. How many of you have found rest in everything that you've had to do for Jesus? I got no takers on that. What does rest mean, right? What does it mean to rest? I had this, this thing, right? My favorite blanket. When we rest, does that mean that everything is done and everything is over and there's nothing else for us to worry about anymore, right? Right, no. A rest is when you, you take some time and you stop from working, right? You take a moment and you t or you take a break is another way to say it. You take a break. And you know at the end of this rest, there's still something for you to do. There's something that's going to have to be picked up and started again. Or something that's going to have to be picked up and continued again. Rest is not an end to a job. Rest is not the end of work. A rest is not the end of burden. Jesus doesn't say, come to me, all of you who are burdened and heavy laden, and I will take away all of your burdens. Right? What does he say? For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. doesn't say that there's not a burden. But that it's lighter. And to take a yoke upon you, what does that mean? Oxen, right? The yoke of oxen, right? And what happens when you put two oxen in a yoke? What happens? They work together. There you go. They work together, right? One of them might be able to do more work than the other one. But they still work together. It doesn't mean that you're not going to have a burden, but who's going to be in that, in that yoke with you and who's going to help you along with your burden? In this, in this, in Matthew here, right? And two oxen, it's two oxen that are pulling the, the yoke together and they're working together. And one of them could be weaker and you put it in with a stronger one so that it makes it stronger, right? As it goes along, right? It's going to get stronger, even though the stronger one is pulling the heavier load. It's going to grow and it's going to get bigger and it's going to be able to do more. And in our yoke today in Matthew, who are you in that yoke with? Jesus. Jesus says, come to me and take upon my yoke. So that means Jesus is now helping you with your problems. Jesus is now helping you with your burden. Notice I didn't say taking it away. Jesus is helping you with. Jesus is walking alongside you with and doing this. Jesus came to go and show the people what needed to be done. He did it in a way that most people didn't like. But it, that doesn't matter because Jesus said, if you come to me and follow after me, I'm going to help you with your problems. And I'm going to help you do what Paul tried to do. Right? Where Paul, in the tongue-tied, tongue-twister of Romans chapter 7 the things that I don't want to do are the things that I do do. And the things that I need to do. Hold on, step back. The things that I need to do, I don't do. And the things that I don't want to do, I do do. Yes, I said do do. <laughs> A couple times now. <laughs> right? Because that's, we think it's all about what we do. And it's not about what we do. It's about who we are and whose we are and how we walk through life in that. Right? It's not about what do I have to do to be saved. That's not a good question. And I've said this before, right? Yeah, people come knock on your door and go, if you were to die tonight, you know where you're going to go. 
right? Are you saved? If you were to meet the maker this evening, if you were to stand at the pearly gates today and and St. Paul or St. Peter would ask you your name, would your name be there and would you go to heaven? Is that the right question to ask? What do you need to do to be saved is not the right question. It's not about where you're going to go. It is, but it isn't. Because it's not about you standing there and saying, Peter asking you your name and telling you where you're going to go. The question isn't about what you need to do to be saved. The question is, God has saved you through his grace, named you and claimed you at that font, made you to be his child and has asked you to come and carry his yoke with him out into the world to do things. So the question isn't what do you need to do to be saved? The question is, now that you're saved, what are you going to do about it? Right? It's not a, it's not a, I don't have to do anything, I can just sit on my butt, which, which a lot of us want to do, and do nothing. You've been saved. You've been changed. You're walking with Jesus in that yoke. Now what are you going to do about it? How is your life going to be different? Because God has claimed you in that font. Because God has set you higher than anyone else. Because God has lifted you out of the pit that you put yourself into and is now asking you to walk with him and he's willing to help you carry your burden. How is your life going to be different? And how are people going to see that? So that's what Paul said. Because our flesh still fights with us. The things that are happening around us, we still want to do those. Those things that we used to do are the things that we still want to do. But God is calling us to a better path. And God is calling us to greater things. So he's asking you, Come and let him help you. But in that helping, you're also taking on part of his burden as well. But he wouldn't ask you to come if he didn't know that you couldn't do it. And he wouldn't ask you to come if he didn't know he was going to be there to help you along the way. So the question is, now what? You're saved. You've been freed by Jesus to go into the world. So what are you going to do? Softly. <laughs> 